What is up, everybody? It's Cody with Blood Money MMA Bets, and I'm back with another full card predictions for UFC 295, Projashka versus Pereira. This is going to be an excellent card. Um, there's a ton of good fights on this card. To be honest, I don't think it's the greatest betting card in the world. There's a lot of really good lines, like even lines. You know, there's not a ton of big favorites, but it's they're lined even for a reason. So i um, going to have to make the sharp plays on them and, and get the right sides. But um, overall, it's, it's going to be a really good card, man. I'm a little tired on this, so if I mess up on anything, forgive me. I've been working like crazy. We're back to work, and I've um, been working a lot of hours, man. I've been working a lot of time, so um, I wanted to get this out of the way. But everybody, please, before we get into everything, please smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Leave a comment. Help the algorithm out. If you want to get my bets throughout the week, get them a little earlier. I post them on Twitter and Instagram. It's Blood Money MMA Bets with that. Uh, I got the Layer Cake Discord, which is free. The link's going to be in the description. You can go in there. They bet on all kinds of sports. There's MMA, uh, stock tips. There's every, everything in there, and that's free. Link is in the description. I have the Layer Cake Patreon. That's $10 a month. You're going to get my early bets. You're going to beat line movement. You're going to get my DraftKings lineup. You're going to get my 10 best bets in order of confidence. You're going to get the Layer Cake Parlay. This is where all my extra content is. Um, like I said, just the, you're going to win with the bets, but just the line movement and stuff you beat pays for it all. And there's just a lot of extra content and a great way to help support my channel. Um, we're going to do a quick recap of UFC. Uh, what was that? Um, UFC Sao Paulo. And then we'll get right into this uh, UFC um, 295. UFC Sao Paulo. I went two and two on my bets for plus $15. I had the Armand Saruki or Armand Petrosian fight get canceled. So I ended, only ended up having four bets. It started off really good, two and oh. Um, but two and two plus 15 bucks. My first winning bet was Angela Hill. I told everybody how that fight was going to go down. I even made a post a week or two before talking about do not let what a top 20 girl does to a top 30 girl influence what she could do to a top 10 girl. So Angela Hill was the side the whole time. Second winning bet was Mark Dia Casey in one of the more boring fights you're ever going to see, but he did great. Um, so that's plus 2.5 units on that. My two losing bets, man, these ones kind of hurt. I'm not going to lie. Fakhardinov by decision. He was cruising his way to decision and, um, Took that body kick, got hurt, and uh, ended up getting a 10-8 round. So that became a draw, and it killed my decision prop. Um, and then the second losing bet, I had Eduardo Mora parlayed with Gabriel Bonfin. And um, Bonfin, you know, just flaked out, man. I don't, I don't even know what else to say. Looked great in the first round, looked great for the first minute of the second round, and then just fell apart, and Nicholas Dalby became an animal. So that brings my overall bet record. And these have been tracked since the very beginning. I started at zero, right? Zero dollars, zero bets. 290 and 207 for plus ten thousand seven hundred and sixty five dollars or one hundred and seven point six five units and my 2023 record is 108 and 86 for plus three thousand thirty five dollars or thirty point three five units and uh it's been a good year man i've been winning a, a winning a, a good amount and uh we're gonna keep that going through this year and, and have another positive year as we do and then we're gonna go into this 2024 year and have the biggest year ever i have a whole bunch of new stuff i'm gonna be changing so you see that, man. Um, like I said, I, I, that's a three-week winning streak too. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna take it to four. So, um, yeah, man, definitely check everything out. Check out the Patreons. Check out the Discord. And this is the giveaway for this week, man. This is I told I told everybody it was gonna be a big one for this one. Shout out to Face Meat Fist, man. This is my guy, Dr. Sorowitz, that owns this. Um, we're gonna get him on a show here soon. But here's what's up for bid or up for uh for the prize. Face Meat Fist. That's the Dr. Face Meat Fist shirt this is large so you're going to get this shirt right then you're going to get these seven cards okay some of them have a lot to do with this this card alex pereira prism uh silver refractor rookie alex pereira rookie you're going to get a matt pervola silver prism rookie you're going to get a tabitha ricci silver prism rookie how about this man hasbula how about a hasbula for the 295 hasbula rookie at Sabatini rookie. Then I'm gonna throw this in because the Alex Pereira collection here uh, connection. Here's a Glover Texera autograph card. And last but not least, because this was announced, I believe today or yesterday, Marlon Vera game worn uh jersey or event worn jersey. So um that's seven really cool cards. So these seven cards plus that shirt, um, I'll ship anywhere in the world. 
same rules put down your best three fight parlay with the odds that it pays so that, that that's for the tiebreaker and then if there's one that ties with the same um number then we'll, we'll just give it to whoever posted first so uh like i said all them cards that shirt just participate in the giveaway leave it in the comment section on this video and uh can't wait to see who wins this man it's gonna be awesome i want to go over the layer cake uh winning bets real quick um that we had from the, the the layer cake parlay this is another little thing that we do uh whoop my my bad second oh i'm like i said man my brain is not working very good today so let's see share screen just from working i've been working like crazy lately and uh you know, by the time I leave for work, get home, it's, we're talking 12, 13 hours. But shout out to my boy, Sexy Boy Savala with the big parlay. Um, he had uh, Mark Casey, Eduardo Mora, and Angela Hill, plus 279. Hit, hit, uh, that's a good odds, man. Plus 279 on that. You have an underdog. You had a, a pretty decent money line. I like that. Uh, also, I have Mark Casey by decision. I like that bet, too. Um, Petrino versus Modestus Bukowskis. Petrino by KO. Excellent call. My boy Luigi hitting here with the Petrino KO round two for plus 850. Excellent hit, Luigi. You killed that. Sir Walrus hitting with the nice big parlay. Angela Hill under 2.5 in the uh, uh, I'll make, or wait. So I don't think that hit, right? Yeah, no, I'm tripping. I'm tripping. That was just a bet. Sexy boy Savala. Okay, Mark Casey, Petrino, Renat, Armand Petrosian, Kyle Barallo, Rodrigo Nascimento, over 1.5, and Gabriel Bonfin and Angela Hill. Look at that. Plus 4,194. Five to win 85. Killer hit, man. Killer hit. And here was another one. Uh, Angela Hill over 2.5. Uh, that got canceled. Kyle Barallo over 2.5. Bonfin over 1.5. Fernandez, Mark Casey, Moneyline, Petrino, and Renat Fakradina. Five to win 57, man. That's killing it. My boy Flav, always killing it. Um, let's see, Almeida versus Lewis. Oh, Zaleski over two and a half. That was an excellent hit, man. I should have had that. That was it was either Renat by decision. I got greedy. It was either Renat by decision or the over two and a half. I went with the Renat by decision, but I really thought it was gonna hit. But um, yeah, man, Nascimento, Varallo, uh let's see, uh, and Almeida. That was a big hit too. See, Flav had this one. Flav had this one. Uh, Angela Hill plus one hundred. Man, that was the easiest bet on the card. I don't care what anybody says. Man, that was the easiest play on the card. Dia Casey, Angela Hill. Uh, two two that got canceled. And let's see. Uh, Fireside. Nicholas Dalby, look at this. Fireside. Nicholas Dalby plus four fifty. Uh, uh, Brenner minus two twenty five. <clears throat> Petrino. Fakradinov, Brenner, Barallo, Nascimento, and Almeida plus 498. Nascimento, uh, Parlay, Brenner, uh, yep, that fell off. Kyle, Barallo, straight play, nice. Fakradinov, Barallo, Barallo, Nascimento. Them were all excellent parlays, fireside. And last but not least, we have Mark Dia Casey, Rodrigo, Nascimento, <coughs> Vieira, and Angela Hill. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Okay, um, so that's the layer cake parlays, man. That's the layer cake winning bets that they had. And uh everybody there does great, man. There's there's people there winning on football, baseball, basketball, every other sport that's on, and like I said, stock. So shout out to everybody. Let's get into this fight. Now I got to present. Um let's see. My bad. I'm sorry. Here we go. Here we go. All right. First fight that I have on the card is Steve Urseg versus Alejandro Costa. And um, let's see. They have it up here. And this is in the men's flyweight division. Steve Urseg is 10 and 1. Currently sitting at minus 160. 28 years old. 5 foot 8 with the 68.5 inch reach. Alejandro Castro Costa is 13 and 3. Currently sitting at plus 130. 27 years old. 5 4 with the 67 inch reach. And he's coming in on short notice. You see Steve Ursay is, is 4 inches taller with an inch and a half of reach. 
Uh, Steve Ursaig, man, came in on short notice, fought David Dvorak, his first fight in the UFC, and, and, and looked pretty good. I mean, he was getting he, – he lost the first round and was losing the second round, uh, hit Dvorak with a big shot, and then hit him with a big head kick, rocked him, got a lot of control time, and then showed really good cardio and toughness to take over and win that third round, you know, and take it from a top 10 uh, flyweight guy that was on a uh, – had a, had a lot of decent wins inside the UFC. Uh, outside the UFC, he's fought lower-level competition, but he's looked good in most of them fights. Uh, very well rounded. He's got pretty good boxing. He's got a nice left hook. I really do like uh, uh, Astro Boy's left hook. He's got a sneaky good right head kick. That's what he hit Dvorak with and dropped him. But he's got really good forward pressure and pace. He really puts a pace on guys and he's willing to take your shot to walk you down to hit you with a couple more. Um, he seems to have good offensive and defensive wrestling. He did fine with Dvorak. Uh, he's got really good jujitsu and he, he's just opportunistic. He, he, he gets finishes, you know. Um, he almost finished the Vorak, but he's super tough. You've seen him survive Manal Kate. But before that, he had finished one, two, three, four, five, six out of seven wins, man. The dude's dangerous. He's dangerous striking, and he's dangerous with the jiu-jitsu. He gets a lot of club and subs, but uh, awesome BJJ, awesome scrambles, awesome subs. He's well-rounded. He's got good cardio. He's got good toughness, man. He's going to have that size advantage over Alejandro Castro. Costa's not bad, man. He's decent. You've seen him come in and fight Amir Abazi on short notice. Um, he had a pretty good first round. He showed that he has really good takedown defense, and he's got pretty good striking. He was getting beat up a little bit, tagged a little bit, and then he ended up getting dropped and then finished in that third round. But it was still a decent little fight, you know, and then he came back against Jimmy Flick and was able to get the win there and uh, pound Jimmy Flick out. But we know Jimmy Flick wasn't really ready. Um or shouldn't have been back in the cage. But Costa's got good power, man. He's got powerful leg kicks. That's what he was messing up uh, uh, Flick's leg with. He's got good technical boxing with some decent pop. Good BJJ on top or off his back. He seems pretty dangerous. You know, he'll be throwing up arm bars. Um, he, he's uh, He's got six submission wins, four knockouts, but he's got a lot of different um, the arm bars. One, two, flying arm bar, three, four, five arm bar wins. You know, so that's pretty good. And then he's got power in his hands, too. Uh, Good offensive and defensive wrestling, and he's just a well-rounded fighter. He's good. This is going to be a very good fight. Both these dudes are prospects. Both of them are pretty good. But I'm going to leave leading um, with Steve Ursag, man. This kid looks like he's the real deal. I like his size advantage. He's on a full uh, fight camp for this card or for this fight, and I, I just lean with Ursag. But it's going to be a really good fight because Ursag's not like a dominating guy. Like I said, he was kind of losing to Dvorak until he was winning. So, um, yeah, man, I'll take Ursag, but I, I doubt I'll have a bet on it. But I, I do like him to win. Next fight is in the men's bantamweight division. We got Kung Ho Kang versus John Castaneda. And this is going to be a really good fight, man. Uh, Kang is 19 and 9, currently sitting at plus 120. He's 36 years old, 5'9 with a 73 inch reach. Castaneda is 20 and 6, currently sitting at minus 140, 31 years old, 5'6 with a 71 inch reach. And Kang, man, he's been in the UFC for a while. He's a good fighter, uh, decent striking. He's got a nice long jab and a nice leg kick. He doesn't really throw too many big uh, overhands or big hooks. Um, he, he's definitely pretty technical. He's got nice, smooth calf kicks, though. I do like the calf, calf kicks. That's what he was tearing up Dana back to ground with. Um, he's got good, really good striking defense. That's what I like about him. He's pretty hard to hit. Uh, you've seen against Christian Quinones. Quinones actually cracked him, man, and hurt him a little bit. And then uh, he cracked him back dropped him and then was able to get that submission but he's got a really good striking d he's got pretty good offensive and defensive wrestling he's got pretty good jujitsu when he's on top i mean he's got 12 submission wins and only two ko's but uh he hasn't had too many submissions not in the ufc anyways you know but um great cardio good toughness he's 36 years old he is super durable he's only been finished uh twice in his career and then we're all way back in the day one was like soccer kicks to the head back in 2008 and um the other one was a triangle arm bar back in 2011 so the dude hasn't been finished in you know about 12 years john castaneda i really like his style man he's got really good boxing he's fast he's crisp he's technical he's got that super super fast left head kick you know that's the one that he hit daniel santos with he hit marine muin gafarov with um and it's fast and it's accurate man he put he puts it on people he's got good offensive and defensive wrestling he's got pretty good jujitsu he's got really good cardio he's really really explosive he's well rounded um i like how he he he's a southpaw and he lunges in with his left like it's like a, a fast like he'll he'll back up back up bring you in pull you in right to this fast straight left man i, I really do like that but he's got, like I said, good offensive wrestling. He's got good boxing. He's got that nice head kick. Um, I like him in this fight. I think that uh, 
I think that he's got more potential here. I think that he throws the wider uh, a variety of strikes. I think he uses more kicks to the head. I think that he's going to have the better wrestling here, and he can mix that in. Kung Ho Kang, I thought he lost to a fighter that's kind of like Castaneda. I thought he lost to um, the Na Bakhtara. If you watch the fight back, Bakhtara landed like 40 extra significant strikes and um, landed some really big shots. It was kind of weird, but um, I just feel like Castaneda can do the same thing except mix in some grappling and uh, get the win here. So give me Castaneda. Um, I'm going to say it gets it done by decision because, like I said, Cohen Kang is very, very tough and durable, but I just think that, that Castaneda will have the bigger moments. Next fight is going to be awesome. It's in the women's strawweight division. We've got Tabitha, Baby Shark, Ricci versus Lupita Godinez. Uh, Tabitha Ricci is 9-1, and one, currently sitting at plus 140. She's 28 years old, 5'1", with a 61-inch reach. Lupita Godinez is 11-3, uh, currently sitting at minus 165, 30 years old, 5'2", with a 61-inch reach. So you see everything's pretty much even. Uh, Lupi's going to have one inch of height, but the reach is even. And this is actually a, a strange thing for Tabitha Ricci because I think all of her fights that she's been fighting have been all giant girls for uh, 115. you got Maria Oliveira, who's like 5'6". Um, Pollyanna Viana is what five five. Jessica Panay five five, and then um even uh Jillian Robertson she's what about five five right yeah so to fight a girl that's five two in her size I think will really help her in this fight but she's got good fast kickboxing she's not very powerful but she does pick her strikes well and she she throws really nice leg kicks and she's fast man she'll throw little combos get in get out uh great wrestling excellent judo. She's got the judo background. She's got excellent BJJ. She's got a high level BJJ black belt. Like she's subbing um, uh, Jessica Panay, where Jessica Panay is beating Lupi Godinez. Now, I mean, that was a while ago, but it's like Lupi couldn't even take her down. But uh, yeah, man, Tabitha Ricci has high level jujitsu, was able to take down. Um, uh, oh my God. I told you my brain's going to be messed up. Um, Pollyanna Viana, dude, I'm so tired. I've been up since three in the morning. So yeah, about what, about 15 and a half hours, but, uh, yeah, man, Pollyanna Viana, she was able to take her to the ground, survive on the ground with her and, and flourish a little bit. And then Jessica Panay, same thing, um, was able to take her down, survive, beat her up, stand up. She uses very good fight IQ, like against Jillian Robertson. She didn't even have to go down to the ground and mess around. She just picked her apart on the feet, kept it moving. And, uh, same thing with Panay, you know, did whatever she wanted. But um, very well-rounded. She's very tough, uh, and I like her. I, I like her whole style, and she fights consistent, man. She uses good fight IQ. She's 28 years old. She's on a nice little win streak. Her only loss was to Manon Faro, when she came into the UFC on short notice and fought up a weight class. Lupita Godinez, man, she's got crisp boxing with some pop. She's got nice leg kicks uh, she, with some decent pop on them. She's got pretty good offensive and defensive wrestling, and she's got pretty good jiu-jitsu. Uh, really good forward pressure. She'll throw in combos, and uh, she does have, like, a little bit of pop in her stuff, like I said. And, and she does have good grappling, uh, good uh, good um, cardio, well, decent cardio. That's my problem with her. If you watch her fights, she slows down after that after that first round. She slowed down against Luana Carolina after the first round. She slowed down against Angela Hill after the first round. She slowed down against Cynthia Calvillo after the first round. I thought she lost that fight. And then, of course, she beat the crap out of Elise Reed, but – um. I think she gets a lot of recency bias. I think that she destroys the girl she's supposed to destroy. And I think that when she fights skilled girls that she has trouble with them man, and, and doesn't do all that well. And I think that this is one of the most skilled girls. Everybody I've heard people say that she has the way better, uh, higher level of competition. I don't really see it. I mean, her best fight that she had is Angela Hill and, and like Richie's fought Manan Faro and Richie's fought Nay and, you know, some of the same girls. So, I don't know. I don't think it's that different. I think that this fight's going to be good. I think both these girls are good and well-rounded, but I like Tabitha Ricci. She's the underdog. And I think that the striking isn't all that much different. Like Lupi is going to have a little bit better striking, but I honestly think Tabitha is going to have the better wrestling. And I know she's going to have the better jujitsu. Like Lupi, Lupi, like I said, couldn't even take down Panay. Panay was able to take down Lupi, get control time. Tabitha was just taking Panay down and then just submitted her. You know what I mean? There, there's levels to the grappling game. And I think that uh, a lot of people are real high on Lupi's wrestling, but she couldn't even, she, she can only out wrestle girls that can't wrestle. I like Tabitha Ricci here and I like her a lot. I bet her I got her at plus 150 and, and I'll, I'll do it again. Next fight is in the men's lightweight division. We've got Nazim Sadikov versus Vyacheslav Boroshev. And this is going to be a good fight, man. Nazim is 9-1, and one, currently sitting at minus 140. He's 29 years old, 5'10", with the 69-inch reach. Slava Claus is 7-3, and three, currently sitting at plus 115. 31 years old, 5'10", with the 69-inch reach. I, for some reason, thought Slava Claus was like 36. I don't know. He looks like it. 
Uh, Snazzy, man, you, this dude's good. Uh, you've seen him on the Contender Series, and then you've seen him come in and fight uh, Elder, and then you've seen him fight um, McKinney. And uh, he's good, man. He's got powerful southpaw boxing. He throws good combos. He's got really good clinch knees. That's what he hit Elder with and uh, cut him open. He'll he'll have the better wrestling in BJJ here. He, he's, you know, got decent wrestling and pretty good BJJ, but that's not really his thing to use. You see, like, he's got that, that, the two submissions in his whole career. One came against McKinney, who gasses out. McKinney uh, started the grappling exchange, and then Nas just reversed him and then was able to submit him. And, but he's not really usually going out there and wrestling too much. He did on the Contender Series, and it looked like he slowed down. And um, I wasn't that impressed with it with with his win on the Contender Series, and then that guy has not looked good since then. You know, he's he's lost since then to a, a lower level eight and five guy. And uh, Nas kind of went back and forth with him, but he does uh, his left hand is straight and it has really good power on it. Um, he can hit you with that right hook. But like I said, I really like his clinch knees, um, and I, I just like he's pretty tough. He's pretty durable, but I think he's very 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 hittable. He really only boxes and. Uh, I just I think he's kind of slow. Like Elder was like piecing him up, man, and that 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 was very uh, very worrisome because I had a bet on him and he was definitely losing that fight until he, he hit that knee. Uh, Slava Claus, man, I went back and watched some tape on him and and this dude's good, man. His kickboxing was well, kickboxing and striking is phenomenal. He's got world class kickboxing. He has excellent power in both hands. He throws hooks to the body to the head. He works excellent combos. Um, he's got really, 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 really good left hook to the liver, man. He you've seen against Dakota Bush. That was when he was able to drop him with it. He does. He is able to be taken down, you know. And it's only been about a year and two months, about a little over a year since he fought Mike Davis, and he was taken down like ten times by Mike Davis. But man, he made Mike Davis work the whole time. Mike Davis was like dying and almost didn't want to couldn't come off the bench going in the third round he was like hyperventilating they said so um he pushes a good pace when he's get when he gets taken down he he um is constantly moving to get back up that's why uh, mike davis took him down i think nine times and mark dia casey took him down like nine or ten times because he gets back up but them dudes push a different kind of um pace Nas is a striker man he's gonna like to strike here and this is gonna be a striking match even if Nas does decide to wrestle now I think he should I think he'll try it a couple times um I think that's he's not gonna be able to hold Slava Claus down like this ain't that's not really his game so I think that this is gonna be a striking match and it's gonna be a really good fight and this fight is gonna be super fun to watch I'm gonna lean Slava Claus in this fight man I really think that uh that, that the, the grappling is not gonna matter that much in this fight and that it's gonna be a striking match for 13 or 15 minutes and then that i'm gonna i'm gonna favor slava claus man i think he's a little bit faster i think he throws a lot more combos and i think that um he he gets his kicking game involved a lot more and, he, and he's super powerful but this is going to be a super fun fight to watch the crowd's going to be going nuts but give me slava claus i honestly think that um that he can land the bigger shots we've seen elder doing it to nazim and and it didn't even look like he nazim got all um crazy and going for the kill he just happened to hit him with that really nice knee that cut him open but uh I'm higher on Slava Claus in this fight. I think it's going to be a striking match, and I think Slava Claus is the better striker. And I think, in, and they're both durable, but Slava Claus, man, he's been in there and took took some good shots. Man, Mike Davis to me is better than Nazim, and, and he, that was a really good back and forth fight. I think that Mike Davis has better wrestling and stuff than Nazim. I just think he'd be a better fighter. He's bigger too. I like that Slava Claus is an inch taller. I, I like him having a a little bit of a size advantage will help with the grappling. Next fight is in the men's featherweight division we got dennis bazooka versus jamal emmers uh dennis is 11 and 3 currently sitting at plus 220 26 years old 5'9 with a 70.5 inch reach emmers is 19 and 7 currently sitting at minus 270 34 years old 5'10 with a 74 inch reach so you see emmers will be one inch taller with three and a half inches of reach uh bazooka man i, I watched this tape on him um i'm not that impressed with him he's got decent boxing with some pop um he's got Okay, defensive wrestling. You see him really defensive grappling more, but like on the contender series, you see him get cage controlled. You see him get taken down. You see Sean Woodson, who's a boxer, was cage controlling him, taking him down, like out grappling. What I will say is this dude's super durable. He's got pretty good cardio. He's got decent boxing with some pop, and he's got decent leg kicks. Uh, eight of his last 11 fights have gone to decision. He's not dangerous at all, but he is super durable. But, um, I just don't see where he's better than Jamal Emmers at anywhere in this fight. Uh, Jamal Emmers, way better boxing, way better leg kicks. If you watch that Ashkabal fight, man, he was tearing him up with the leg kicks, and he's just got excellent boxing, excellent timing, excellent wrestling, offensive and defensive. Um, just a good, well-rounded guy. You know, he showed bad fight IQ against uh, Pat Sabatini. 
But you know, you just get overzealous when you drop a guy and you go in for the finish, and then uh, he just got he got a uh, heel hook. But I thought he beat Jack Jenkins, so he could be three and one in his last four fights. And uh, the Giga fight, he also might have won. You know, he's got really good leg kicks, throws volume with them, excellent striking defense. He's very hard to hit. He's got awesome offensive. In defensive wrestling he's got good jujitsu i just think that he's just like both these guys are tough and well-rounded i just think that jamal is bigger and just better everywhere i think it's going to be a really good fight it's going to be three rounds but give me jamal emmers 30 27 and then um he's more dangerous too if something does happen but like i said bazooka is very very durable so i like the over in that fight a lot next fight um actually this is a a, a fill-in fight it's mateus rubeski Versus Nurillo, or it was versus Nurillo Aliyev. Now he's fighting uh, Roosevelt Roberts. And man, I, I'm going with Mateus Rebecca. I had a max bet of 500, five units on him against Nurillo because Nurillo can only wrestle him and Rebecca can stop that wrestling. And then he was going to piece him up standing up. And he's going to do that to Roosevelt Roberts. Roosevelt Roberts, decent offensive and defensive grappling, really good boxing. But he's not going to have better boxing than Mateus. He's definitely not going to have better leg kicks. And he's not going to have the better grappling. You've seen. Uh, uh, What's his name? Jesus, the the dude on the our uh, Ultimate Fighter uh, that I that I was able to outgrapple. But anyways, I'm taking Rebecca. I, I don't know what the line is. I have no bets on him, but I'm taking Rebecca over Roberts. Um, next fight is in the men's 155 pound division. We got Jared Gordon versus Mark Matson. Jared Gordon is 19 and six, currently sitting at minus 200. He's 35 years old, five nine with a 68 inch reach. Mark Madsen is. 12 and 1, currently sitting at plus 165, 39 years old, 5'8 with a 72 inch reach. So you see, Gordon's going to have an inch of hype. Matson will have four inches of reach. Jared Gordon, uh, good boxing, really good boxing, throws decent leg kicks. He has pretty good offensive and defensive wrestling, uh, really good uh, offensive and defensive jujitsu. And then he's got excellent cardio. He's super tough. He's a vet. His boxing's been looking a little better lately. He throws with some pop. You've seen him piecing up Patty Pimblett. Uh, got the win over Leo, Leandro Santos. His last fight with Bobby Green, you know, he got headbutted, went to the ground, and then got ground and pounded out. That was about eight months, uh, seven months ago. But uh, he was looking good before that happened too. But really, he's been looking good lately, man. Really good lead left hook. That's probably his best weapon in a fight is his lead left hook and his cardio strong clinch good wrestling really good scrambles and bjj i mean he's going to be a problem for mark mattson mark mattson's a wrestler he really likes to uh wrestle he likes body lock takedowns he can shoot a single and a double but he's really liking to just body lock takedown you know um hip toss really strong really strong wrestling he's got the olympic stuff um he's got good leg kicks he, he against vince pichel i was pretty impressed with his with his leg kicks um and he was moving a little bit but you know vince about 39 then but he's got pretty decent boxing throws a little bit of power you seen him drop grant dawson in that fight before he ended up getting um beat up but he's got pretty good uh Good wrestling, like I said, and he's got good BJJ. So if he gets you not good BJJ, he's not going to take you down and just sub you out. But he's very strong. He can survive and not get subbed. And he's got enough BJJ to hold most dudes down and, and get some control time. He's very tough. He's very durable. But he's also uh, 39 years old. And then you got Jared Gordon, I think is what, 35 or 36 years old. So it's not like 30, 35. So it's not like he's a, he's much younger. This is a good fight. It's tough to call. Honestly, I'm going to take Jared Gordon by decision because I think he has a little bit better striking and I think he's going to be able to keep this fight standing. Uh, even if Mark Madsen does get him down, I don't think that he's just going to be able to control Jared Gordon. I think that Jared Gordon has a little bit better cardio when it comes to the third round. So if it's 1-1 going into that third round, I, I, I favor Jared Gordon to win that third round. So give me Jared Gordon in a pretty close fight, but give me Jared Gordon by decision. Next fight is going to be a banger, man. We got Joshua Van versus Kevin Borjas. Joshua Van is 8-1, uh, and one, currently sitting at minus 240. He's 22 years old, 5'5 five, five with the 65-inch reach. Kevin Borjas is 9-1, and one, currently sitting at plus 190, 25 years old, 5'5 five five with the 68-inch reach. So you see same height, Borjas 3 inches of reach, and Borjas 3 years of age advantage. Joshua Van, man, he looked really good against Zalgis uh, Zumagulov last fight where he got the split decision. He showed you that he has powerful, fast, accurate boxing. His jab is beautiful, man. His jab is beautiful with some real pop on it. He feints to set up a power one-two like he has excellent speed, excellent feints, excellent striking defense. His one-two so fast and powerful. That's what he was hitting Z Zagalskis with and then rocked him with the one. Uh, uh, 
fast leg and head kick hit Zagalskis with a freaking fast head kick too. And they're with power. Everything this kid does with power and he throws volume with power. He landed the most strikes ever by a debuting featherweight, but um, he showed good defensive and often defensive grappling against Zagas Zumagulov. But when he came out, um, the announcer said that he had only been grappling for six months at that point. So he's about 21 and a half when he started wrestling or doing BJJ, which is crazy because he's just a striker from Myanmar. But um, man, he's got tons of volume. Like I said, he hits really hard. He seems to be super athletic. He seems to be tough, dur tough durable. He has excellent cardio and um, super fast hands, throwing just really good boxing. But I like his head kicks and I like his leg kicks. Kevin Borjas, man, you've seen this kid on the Contender Series. Excellent cardio, excellent toughness, excellent boxing, uh, really good get-up game because Victor Diaz was taking him down, but he was showing patience, stayed safe, and was able to get up. Fast boxing with Pop, man. Excellent jab. He, these Both these dudes have phenomenal jabs, and he uses his jab to set up all of his combinations, throws a crazy amount of volume. Most of it's with power. He works the body really well, works that liver, left hook to the liver, super nice. He's volume, cardio, toughness. This fight is going to be amazing because neither dude I don't think is going to knock each other out. I'm taking Joshua Van, but this line's way off. But I'm taking Van for the fact that I like his head kick. And if you go watch uh, Kevin Borjas's only loss, he was head kicked and then choked out. And um, that's exactly what Joshua Van's going to be bringing, a very fast head kick. So I think this fight is going to be a banger. I think the only difference is like Joshua Van may be able to land the knockdowns. I think he hits a little harder in Borjas. So, Bor so I think he's going to have the bigger moments. So give me Joshua Van by decision. Now let's get to some crazy fights. Matt men's 155 pound lightweight division. Matt, the steamroller Fravola versus Benoit Benoit Saint Denise. Man, this is gonna be just a, a freaking phenomenal firefight. Matt Fravola, 11, 3, and 1, currently sitting at plus 185, 33 years old, five foot nine with a 71 inch reach. Benoit Benoit. I don't know why I want to say it. Benoit is 12 and 1, currently sitting at minus 225, 27 years old, 5'11 with a 73 inch reach. So you see, uh, Benoit, Benoit is 5'11, so he's two inches taller with two inches of reach. And he's just a big ass lightweight, man. But Matt Favola, this dude, you've seen him fight in the UFC for a long time, man. He's very well rounded. He's got super powerful boxing. I actually think that his kicking game's been getting better against Drew Dover. He was throwing some head kicks and stuff, but I actually think that, uh, his whole game is just getting so much better than when he was just a crazy wild man when he entered the UFC. Uh, his striking, phenomenal power. Both of his hooks will put you to sleep. I don't care. He put Drew Dober to sleep with that right hook. Hit uh, Atman and Zaytar with them hooks. He had dropped Gennaro Valdez about five or six times. The dude comes from a wrestling background. He's got good offensive and defensive wrestling. He's got good jujitsu, good scrambles, good ground and pound. He's a junkyard dog that throws power into everything, man. Well, he's got a wild, crazy style that works. And, 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 and against Drew Dober, he was backing up the whole time and just letting Drew Dober come to him. And he was just countering him with big shots until finally hit him with the one uh, that really hurt him. But he's just a well-rounded, crazy, powerful striker that hits very hard, that can knock you out with either hand. Uh, well-rounded, like I said, good offensive, defensive wrestling, excellent scrambles. Uh, he's fighting a beast, though, in Benoit St. Denis. Man, this dude is a savage. Just a complete savage. You've seen the beating he was able to take against Zaleski Dos Santos. Comes back against Nicholas Stoltze and rear naked chokes him, takes him down, beats the crap out of him. Uh, does the same thing to Gabriel Miranda on short notice. And just He walks guys down. He puts crazy pressure on them, and he starts beating them up. He comes out of the southpaw stance. He throws that crazy southpaw body kick that he did hit uh, Ismael Bomfine with 20, 20 times before he took him down and choked him out. Then, man, his last fight with Tiago Moises was just crazy. He's just walking him down, beating him up, taking him down, beating him up. And it's just his will versus your will. And uh, he was able to take Tiago Moises' will. But this fight's different, man. They both got good wrestling. They both got good jujitsu. They both got, you know, pretty good striking. They're both durable. They're both tough. But, man, like Matt Frivola is going to hit ben, Benoist, Benoit St. Denis harder than anybody's ever hit him. And, like, I've seen Benoit get stuck by – um, uh, get hit with that knee by Stoltze that hurt him. I've seen him take a couple shots from even Gabriel Miranda that kind of stuck him in his tracks. And then Tiago Moises hit him with some shots. So it scares me. It really scares me um, that uh, Frivola is going to be the one that's going to be able to crack his chin. I can't pick for Vola right now. I want to. As an underdog pick, like a big underdog pick, he, he's, he seemed so tempting – the only thing I don't like, because he did have his good fight with um, 
Armand Sarukian had some good scrambles and all that stuff and uh, showed, showed really good heart against Sarukian. The problem is, is that he slowed down in that third round and then Sarukian started taking him down. He accepted bottom position and um, you can't get tired, man. I don't think St. Denis, even though it does look like he got tired in the second round against Tiago Moises, it looks like he, he got tired in the second round um, or he did get tired against uh, Tiago Moises. Moises took him down. He sat there for about like 30 seconds and got back up and proceeded to beat him. So, dude, this fight is going to be crazy. I don't have no bet on this fight. I don't blame anybody taking for Vola. I'm going to take St. Denis. I'm going to say that he's able to land, it survive some of the big shots that's landed. He lands some big shots. He just keeps wearing on for Vola, wearing on for Vola, wearing on him. And then finally, either in that third round, um, he gets a finish or, you know, this fight could even go to decision. Fervola went to decision with Jalen Turner. Fervola went um, to decision with Armand Sarukian. The dude's tough. The dude's durable. And maybe he makes it to decision or maybe he gets Benoit over there. Benoit, Benoit. But give me Benoit, but I'm not that confident in that fight like a lot of people might be. Uh, next fight is in the men's featherweight division. We got Pat Sabatini versus Diego Lopez. Pat Sabatini is 18 and 4. Currently sitting at minus 120. He's 33 years old, five foot eight with a 70 inch reach. Diego Lopez is 22 and six. Currently sitting at plus 105. 28 years old, 5'11 with a 72.5 inch reach. Pat Sabatini, man, decent karate striking style. Uh, not very durable, so he doesn't really like to strike too long, but he does have decent kicks. Okay boxing, but like I said, doesn't take a shot very well. Where he shines is in the wrestling game. His wrestling is really good. He puts a pace and pressure on guys. He chain wrestles really well. He gets guys in the clinch, gets them up against the cage, proceeds to work single legs, double legs, tosses. He can do all the different takedowns. Um, and, he, and then when he gets on top, you know, he's a high-level black belt. He's got world-class cardio. He's he, he sets a crazy pace. And um, most guys can't keep up with it, you know what I mean? Like he does jiu-jitsu tournaments you see outside of the UFC. And uh, his jiu-jitsu is very heavy on top. He's very short, muscular, thick dude. So when he gets on guys, he's got short arms. You're not getting arms. You're not getting legs. And he's got really good ground and power. You see him against Lucas Almeida, man. He was beating him up, uh, made him give up his bad positions, and then was able to arm triangle out, triangle him out in that second round. But that was after giving him a beating. But uh, like I said, decent karate striking. You know, he doesn't want to strike because he's not he's not durable at all. You've seen him get rocked and get finished by um, Damon Jackson. Really quick in the first round, you see him get dropped by Jamal Emmers and get hurt really bad in that fight and uh, ended up getting the heel hook. But he he's just seems really, really chinny, you know. And uh, Diego Lopez, man, this dude, I watched him fight down in Nashville. He's a beast. He's, he's a good fighter. He's got pretty good long striking with some good pop, uh, mainly boxing. He's got great BJJ, man. On top, it's okay. He can take the back and he's good. But off his back is where he's the most dangerous, it seems like, man. His arm bars, triangle arm bars, triangle choke. Um, are all really, really, really well. Um, very dangerous off his back, like I said, with that triangle and arm bar. He's got a good clinch knees. He's got good Muay Thai clinch knees, which I think could really help him in this fight with the shorter uh, Pat Sabatini. And um, he's very dangerous, man. He's very, very dangerous. He's finished 20 of his 22 wins, 12 submissions, 8 KOs. He's fought lower-level guys. I mean, he came in. He had a good fight with Joe Anderson Brito on a contender series where he looked good, but he, he lost that uh, decision. Um, but he, he was looking good off his back, but he was also getting ground and pounded really, really bad. Then he came in, he had a good fight with Mavsar Ivalev. He came in on short notice. Ivalev was supposed to fight, I believe, uh, uh, Bryce Mitchell, and he ended up fighting him. And that's a weird fight. And he gave Ivalev a, a really good fight in that one. But, um, I mean, it was just, you know, that's a tough guy to just take on a week's notice and not really get your jiu-jitsu game and all that up. But this fight is going to be really good. I mean, Diego Lopez is the far more dangerous guy. Um, he's, he's definitely going to be more dangerous on his feet and he's going to be real dangerous with submissions in that first round. My problem with him after watching that bunch of tape is, um, he, he tends to slow down after the first round because he goes so hard with them submissions. He'll slow down and he plays off his back way, way, way too much. You know, he's just happy with it. And I, I believe that Pat Sabatini is going to be the better wrestler here. And as long as Pat Sabatini survives any striking, I think he takes Diego Lopez down, man. I think he stays safe. I think he wears on him. I think he beats him up with, uh, with um, some ground and pound. And Pat, like I said, if it, this was most other people, I bet Lopez big against Gavin Tucker because Gavin Tucker was coming back from a big shoulder injury and that uh, I just knew Lopez was going to have really good jiu-jitsu for him off his back. But Pat Sabatini, sabatini has got some of the best wrestling and jiu-jitsu I've seen in the 145-pound division. So I can't just say that Lopez is going to knock him out because he's not really that knockout striker. Like he does have decent striking with some decent pop, but it's not like he's a striker. And then um, if he goes to the ground, he's good. He's a jiu-jitsu guy with decent striking and stuff. And I think Pat Sabatini, 
Diego Lopez is more than happy to go to the ground. And I think, Pat, Pat, like, so Pat Sabatini isn't going to have to even work too hard for these takedowns. And I think that he's just going to control him, stay safe, beat him up, do enough to uh, to keep keep the control time going. And I think he gets a decision win. I'm not betting this fight. I went into that fight wanting to bet Diego Lopez. I love getting me underdogs and stuff, but man, I don't like guys that are like, like bomb fiend, you know, you get one round, man. And then Lopez is going to come out slower in that second. And um, he's going to have a couple more dangerous moments throughout the fight. But other than that, Sabatini is going to be consistent and dangerous the whole time. I stayed away from it. I like Sabatini. Next fight is in the women's strawweight division. We got Jessica Andrade versus Mackenzie Dern. Andrade is 24 and 12, currently sitting at plus 165. She's 32 years old, 5'1 with a 62-inch reach. Dern is 13 and 3, currently sitting at minus 200. She's 30 years old, 5'4 with a 63-inch reach. Jessica Andrade, man, she's got excellent boxing, really good power in both hands. She'll throw hooks. She'll throw really good combos coming forward. Super powerful. Um, KO power in both hands. She throws uh, in combo. She's got pretty good defensive and offensive wrestling, and um, she's just a well-rounded, tough girl. The problem is, is, man, she has been looking terrible lately. You know, uh, she had that good win over Lauren Murphy, but that was terrible at 125. She's older and slower, and, and, and Andrade just pieced her up. But before that, she had that nice standing triangle choke over Amanda Lemos. But, dude, she was getting pieced up before she got that, and then she had Cynthia Calvillo. But these last three fights are kind of concerning because she took the Blanchfield fight on short notice, but she was getting pieced up in the striking, and then she got taken down. As soon as she got taken down, she was choked out shortly after. She drops back down to 115 to fight uh, Yan Zian, and uh, she got knocked out in one minute just trying to chase her around and um, got hit with some big counter strikes. She was getting pieced up that whole fight. And uh, we seen Yan Zian, we, 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 Shanan with uh, uh, Mackenzie Dern, she was able to take them punches and, and land some big ones herself and almost beat Yan, you know, so it's a, it's a big difference. Then she fought Tatiana Suarez, like her manager's terrible, giving her all these wrestlers, and now they're going to give her Mackenzie Dern. But then she fought Suarez, you know, her striking does not look good. I don't know if she's taking this serious anymore. This is what her fourth fight, and this would be her fifth fight, I believe, in 2023, and she's one and four. Yes, yeah, so she's got four fights already. She's one and four. Her only win is over Lauren Murphy. Then she only fought one time in 2022. So she's, man, she's just not been looking good. Her, the momentum's not on her side. She just fought three months ago and got beat up by Tatiana Suarez, got knocked out three months before that. How is she getting any better? Is she even taking any time off, doing anything to get better? Mackenzie Dern, divorced Mackenzie Dern, man, is a wild fighter. Um, She gets more improved every single fight. Uh, She's, she's, starting to be one of the most improved fighters, you know, from the beginning where she only had jujitsu, she had the worst wrestling, the worst striking. She's built her body up. She's strong. And now she's got good striking. She's very aggressive. She's got excellent jujitsu. Her wrestling's better. She gets you in the clinch and takes you down from the cage control, um, uses the clinch to pull guard and to get her takedowns. Dangerous submission game, man. World class jujitsu on top, on bottom. It doesn't matter. She's on the ground. She is winning on the ground. Nobody just holds her on her back or nothing. Um, she showed power in her hands against Angela Hill and she showed nice knees, man. She was hitting her with some big ass knees that dropped her. She's hitting her with the hands that dropped her. She had her in so many dangerous positions on the ground. She showed a new and improved cardio because she used to gas out in that third round. No, like everybody knows that she used to slow down bad in that third round. And now she looked good in a five round fight. Um, she her style is very unpredictable. You don't know if she's gonna shoot in, you don't know if she's gonna throw a power shot, a knee, what. And I think that helps her game so much, man. She came in in the best shape of her life against Angela Hill. She's she was on a way, uh, uh, a new strength and conditioning program. And you can see it, man. You can see it in her shoulders. You can see it everywhere. And uh, I like her three inch height advantage. And I like her two inch or one inch reach advantage. She's going to be the bigger girl. That's going to help her get the takedowns. And I think she can land some big shots on the feet. And I think that once she gets this fight to the ground, she can find the submission. Uh, she almost submitted uh, Zian Zian a couple different times and she fought out of it like crazy. She almost submitted Angela Hill a couple different times. She fought out of it like crazy. Them girls got that dog in them. I, uh, Mackenzie Dern is a skilled junkyard dog. This girl, you've seen her last fight. This girl's a skilled junkyard dog. And Jessica Andrade used to have that dog in her, but I'm not calling her. She ain't no junkyard dog no more, man. She, 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 she ain't. So give me the junkyard dog, Mackenzie Dern, to either get a dominant decision, landing some big shots, and uh, getting some grappling going too, and, uh, or getting that submission at some point. You know, I think if she gets in one dominant position on Jessica Andrade, this fight is going to be over. So give me Mackenzie Dern. Give me her by like, you know, 
I don't know. Like I said, it's either going to be submission or decision. So I, I don't know if you can make them kind of bets. Next fight is the co-main event, man. This is going to be crazy. We got Sergey Pavlovich versus Tom Aspinall. Sergey is 18 and one. Currently sitting at minus 105, 31 years old, six foot three with the 84 inch reach. Tom Aspinall is 13 and three. Uh, currently sitting at minus 115, 30 years old, 6'5", with a 78-inch reach. Sergey Pavlovic, man, um, the bone crusher, man, fast, long boxing. It's accurate. It's powerful. He can knock you out if he even barely touches you with that right hand. He can knock you out with that left hand. Um, he comes forward. He's willing to eat a shot. That's one thing I like about him. The dude is durable. He's, he's able to eat a shot. To give you a shot or two, when he smells blood in the water, dude, he kills. He goes for the kill. You've seen it against Ty Tuavasa. You've seen it against Derek Lewis, which that was an early stoppage. You've seen it against Shamil, Maurice Green, Marcelo Gollum, uh, Gome. You've seen it against Curtis Blades, Ty Tuavasa. As soon as he gets these guys hurt, he goes for the finish. Showed pretty good defensive wrestling against Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades, when he got hurt, tried to take him down real quick, kind of rushed the shot. You know, it's kind of telegraphed a little bit. He was able to get the underhook, shuck it away. Um, looked pretty decent there. But in his one loss to Alistair Overeem, you know, where the striking was pretty good, but he didn't fight like he does now. When he fought Overeem, that this was that was before he would just come out and go for broke, you know. And uh, him and Overeem were going back and forth. He got this little Overeem tried to take him down a bunch, and he actually showed some good takedown defense. And then Overeem hit him with this weird, he got him off balance, hit him with this weird Muay Thai like trip man and, and he tripped him down got on top of him and pounded him out it did look like um like uh Pavlovic is like a turtle you know on on his shell when he when he was on his back because he's just such a big thick dude that, that he couldn't do much but like I said phenomenal fast boxing with crazy KO power comes forward it cuts the ring off and just starts throwing bombs at you durable can take a shot to give one Tom Aspinall, man, I'm so high on this guy. His boxing is so fast, crisp, and technical. Like, And then he's so fast. He's so big. He darts in. He's moving around. He's light on his feet. He's got excellent leg kicks. He's got really good, fast, high kick, man. He was showing that against uh, Volkov and even against, um, really against Tybora, man. I really liked how he looked in that fight. But he hurts guys when he hits them with the boxing. Like I said, he's fast. He's big. He's actually going to have a two-inch height advantage here. It's the first time I, I think Pavlik's really fought somebody bigger than him. He fought Maurice Green, but that dude's a stick. Like, Tom Aspinall's a big dude. But um, what I really like about him is his blast double, man. You've seen that against uh, Andre Alexander Volkov, where he was able to take him down, beat him up. Volkov got back up. He did a whole another one. Boom, took him down, and then got that uh, straight arm lock. And his jujitsu, he's a black belt. And his jujitsu is awesome, man. When he gets guys down, they don't last too long. You've seen it against uh, Andre Orlowski, where he's able to rear naked choke him. He took him down and probably had him down for nine seconds and then choked him out. But uh, he's just really fast, really big, good movement. I don't like his striking defense. It seems like he's hittable. You know, he bounces in the pocket and his head's just right there. He's not really moving off the center line. But uh, and he kind of keeps his chin up. Even even Tybora hit him with a couple little shots. You've seen um, uh, uh. Curtis Blades hit him with a shot even before he blew his knee out. Like he he hit him with a decent little shot. And then Volkov hit him with one that caught him off balance and dropped him, actually. But uh man, this is gonna be such a good fight, man. This is really the fight I'm looking for. This is more interesting to me than Stepe and Jones, to be honest. And I I can't actually I can't wait to watch this fight. Um, Tom Aspinall's in short notice. Sergey was supposed to be the backup for the main event if John Jones or Stepe got hurt. So he's been training for this. But I don't, I don't know if that matters. As long as Aspinall's in shape, this fight ain't going to go too long. You know, it's going to go one way or the other. Is Pavlik going to hit him and knock him out? Or Aspinall, is he going to hit him and knock him out? Or shoot that blast double and take Pavlik down and uh, do some work? So my pick, and I wanted to bet him, but I'm like, I'm just going to stay away and watch this because you don't have to bet this, man. This is going to be chaos and just fun enough. I picked Tom Aspinall. I think Tom Aspinall has the boxing, the movement to stay with, uh, to survive with Pavlik. And I think that he's so fast and he shoots that blast double that when Pavlik comes forward, throwing him power punches, he ducks under, takes him off his feet, man. I think he's going to sub Pavlik. I really do. I think he finishes him on the ground. So give me Tom Aspinall as the new interim champion. Next fight is the main event. We got Yuri Prohashka versus Alex Pereira. Yuri Prohashka is 29, 3 and 1, currently sitting at plus 105, 31 years old, 6'3 with the 80-inch reach. Alex Pereira is 8 and 2, currently sitting at minus 125, 36 years old, 6'4 with the 80-inch reach. So you see it's about all oh, even. Uh Pereira's one inch taller, and then the reach is all the same. Pereira's five years older. Prajaka, man, this guy, he's good. He's good. I, before I break it down, though, I want to say he's coming off a shoulder injury. 
um, that I didn't say this, but Dana White said that the UFC doctor said was the worst shoulder injury he ever seen. So they said that Prajaka, he he pulled it, he like dislocated it or pulled it out of socket uh, during training. And then his coach, you know, wanted to just pull it back in instead of taking him to the doctor. And he said that when his coach was pulling it, he just ripped everything that was in there. So he had to have a big surgery. He's been gone about 11 months, which seems like a short amount of time to be able to like rehab it, get it, get it back to normal and then start training again. But the thing is, man, this dude's like, he's like Tony uh, uh, Ferguson, you know, he's, he's kind of a wild man. He trains his own ways. He does all the his stuff different and he probably rehabbed it and stuff like how tony ferguson blew out his acl didn't do he rehabbed it himself and was back fighting like six months later and has never been the same since so um but that's that's what i get out of perjaka but then this dude is a dangerous mofo man powerful boxing with both hands smooth switch stances and he hits very hard from awkward angles that really hurt guys. He's got KO power in both hands. Um, really nice front kicks to the body too. I really like them. He was hitting uh, Volcom with them, hitting uh, Reyes with them, even Glover a little bit. But he he uh, he's got decent offensive and defensive grappling. Uh, he can be taken down, but he's got a pretty good get up game. And then he's got off uh, okay offensive grappling, but you don't really see him ever using that. He used it. It did a little bit against Dominic Reyes uh, because Reyes was piecing him up, so he kind of had to. But uh. Decent grappling, like I said, pushes a crazy pace, has crazy man cardio, uh, super tough, super durable, and um, really good boxing, you know, and, and just being a wild man coming forward with wild pressure, he keeps his hands down. He's very, 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 very hittable. Uh, like I said, Glover was even landing some big ass shots on him, had him hurt once. Um, then uh, Reyes had him hurt a couple times. Reyes actually knocked him out with an up kick for a second, and it was and uh, hurt him on the feet standing up when he, what's his name was trying to be cocky, and Reyes hit him with a couple big shots. So uh, Volkan Ustamir hurt him in the first round too of their fight. So he got hurt against Ustamir, he got hurt against Reyes, and he got hurt against uh, Glover. All three of his fights in the UFC has been hurt, and all three of them fights he was not fighting Alex Pereira. Man, when this guy hurts you, he's putting you to sleep. So Alex Pereira, as we all know, world world class. Glory kickboxing champion, probably one of the best kickboxers in the history of the sport. A uh, huge dude, man. 6'4 with that 80 inch reach is just huge. He's got excellent boxing with that crazy left hook of death that he just, you know, puts everybody out with. That's what he that's what started the uh finish to Israel Adesanya. Plus, he finished Izzy with the left hook in uh kickboxing. Got Sean Strickland with it. You know, the dude is just dangerous. He's got excellent flying knees. His calf kick is what I really, really love. They're just fast. He just whips it there. He does, there's no show, there's no whining his hips. He just flicks it out there. Bing, bing. But you could see, like, even against Israel Adesanya in the second fight, um, it was doing damage to him. It was already doing damage within like a round and a half, but he showed improved grappling. That's what I really like. He showed improved grappling against Jan Blahovitz, who's a big, strong dude who's used grappling to win fights before. And I think would out grapple Yuri if it came down to it. But uh, he was able to survive with him. He got taken down in the first round. He survived. He got up. He stayed up in the second round. He got taken down later in the third round. But I thought I bet on Jan. And then when I went back and watched it, I did think Alex won because he landed the bigger shots in the third round before he was taken down. But man, this is going to be such a good fight. I can't wait to watch this fight too. I'm, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm mad we lost John Jones, Stipe, but we do still have two of the best fights in the world. We have the two best dudes at one eight, at one eighty five, or men's light heavyweight, and we got the two best heavyweights. So I, I, we can't ask for more. In this fight, I am taking Alex Pereira. I think this would be a phenomenal fight, and maybe would have favored Yuri if he was still champ and had never hurt his shoulder so bad, but I have a right shoulder injury and I'm going to have to have a surgery on it. And it's been messed up for like 10 years. And it's the worst thing. Like I can't, you lose your, your range of motion. Like it, it just doesn't work the exact same. You know what I mean? Like to even throw a punch, like to, I, my arm doesn't go the same. So with the surgery injury he had, there's no way within one year, his arm can just be going the perfectly same and doing everything he needs to do. And I think, I mean, coming in, it's been 11 months. I'm taking Pereira. Um, I say that Pereira just catches him with something, man. These dudes are going to be throwing big punches, and I think Pereira is the biggest puncher that Yuri's ever fought. And I think, think Pereira hits him with that left hook at some time. I think he can hurt him with some leg kicks, stay safe, um, and just hit him, hit him, hit him. And like I said, this too is more of like Yuri. I don't think he 100%. I think he's coming back, excuse me, way too soon. And I just don't think that he's going to be the same exact fighter he was before he left. Give me Alex Pereira to be the new 205 pound champ and he was the 185 pound champ. And then he's just got, uh, I want to think he went to glory or a K one hall of fame. Man, this dude is a bad mofo. So give me Alex Pereira and they're going to put on a crazy, crazy fight, man. I appreciate everybody for checking out this video and, uh, 
please hit that like and subscribe button. I put a ton of work into this and I really appreciate everybody that supports my channel, supports uh, sharing my tweets and just, you know, comment and doing all that stuff for me. I, I really appreciate it. And um, that's what keeps me going doing this stuff. So I appreciate it. I will see you guys Thursday night with Johnny K picks for that live show. And I will be on chronic combat tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern. So check us out on that. See you guys later.